Welcome to Teachers Teaching Teachers. It is the uh, 30th, almost the end of July 2014, and we're doing a show that I've been wanting to do for some time now because uh, I'm real interested in online annotations and tools that we can use around all those things. Um, and and I love Terry Elliott, and he seems to love those things too. So, <laughs> I, so at any rate, um, this summer I started using um, Now Comment, and I got to tell you, um, uh, Dan Dornberg uh, it, like res responded, and we started conversations, and I said, oh, this is perfect timing. So, and then um, Vialogs is something that we love also, and um, so Mason. Um, is that right? That's right. Mason Hooten is with us, and Mason, um, you you right here uh, today. You sent me an email talking about EdLab, where Vialogs comes out of, and I thought it captured a lot of why I do like all this stuff. Um, and I found a connection here between you and Dan too. Um, hi. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I was just going to. Um, EdLab, you say we engage in projects related to the future of learning. In the presence of a world of new technology, uh, new takes on tradition. That phrase is really a cool phrase, I think, um, for us to be thinking about, new takes on tradition, and new attitudes about learning that have come with them. Um, so deep reading, um, reading carefully, I think is something, you know, going deep with, with things is something, and connecting with other people is something that I think um, we have been doing for many years. Um, in in national writing projects and and other places, educators. So, uh, but the tools you guys have been developing, and you're the um, you can represent here better than I can. Um, help us do that, I think, and help us connect in new ways. So let's jump in. We're going to look, um, Terry. You can be our guide to other things as well, but we're going to look particularly at now comment and at dialogues and think about some of um, the possibilities there. Terry, do you want to, can you do a, your own introduction? Like, why are you interested in these tools? Assuming you uh, are. You have been, I think. Yeah. yeah you I've do yourself first, if you don't mind. Sorry. Yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm Terry Elliott. I uh, teach at uh, Western Kentucky University. Um, and I teach uh, composition, uh, mostly freshmen, then I teach um, uh, a research uh, comp class as well, and uh, I've been using and I mean personally, I've been using annotation tools for quite a while. Uh, starting with Digo, I still use Digo a lot. In fact, this Digo is still my main personal and professional tool for annotating. Um, but uh, also using uh, tools like uh, like Vialogs for video annotation. And uh, now it looks like uh, now comment as well is a is a way to uh, to do group annotations uh, fairly fairly easily. And I uh, I just uh, you know I'm interested in uh, annotating the world. You know everything from uh, uh, augmented reality, which is you know still in its infancy, but I think that's coming. Uh, all the way to just uh, simple text annotations. So I have a wide ranging interest in uh, in all kinds of uh, uh, even annotating sounds, uh, music, uh, annotating uh, pictures. Of course, Flickr has had that almost since the beginning, where you can annotate. Um, so uh, you know, and especially in light of um, of um, Mark Andreessen giving fifteen million dollars to uh, Rap Genius um, the other day. For them, uh, you know, the capital, venture capital money, uh, and he, he said. And by the way, this really is the this is the thing that was originally in the Mosaic browser that we took out was annotation, and he's so he has this long term uh, interest himself in annotation that goes all the way back to Mosaic and the Mosaic browser that they had to take out because of the technical problems they had with trying to create a server. <laughs> Basically, a server as big as the internet would become, which is impossible. So, uh, you know, I, I have a lot of interest in this, and I'm really looking forward to hearing what you guys have to say about the technical side, the front end, and the non-technical stuff. And I just like messing around with this stuff. 
<laughs> can, can you say a little, little more about why? Um, I mean, I, and I'll say that I, you know, I always refer back to this thing. I realize now it's 30 years old. It's like one page long, and I put it up in Nell comment um, last night, but by Ann Bertoff from English Journal, I think it was, where she talks about, you know, um, dialectical notebooks as being a way to form your thought as you're reading. I mean, mm -hmm. is that what it's about? Is it, is it about the change? Is it about how it changes the reading process? And Terry, or I mean, is it, that's part of it. Yeah, I think it is. I think it's that um, it's that uh, close, slow um, engagement with reading. I mean, I love poetry, and you know, one of the things you have to do with a poem is you have to read it out loud to really get any of it as far as I'm concerned you have to breathe the words that were originally written and uh, you know we can't do this kind of close reading all the time we have to pick and choose but I, I really think I think of annotation as a way to learn it's just a really fantastic way to learn because you know not only are you reacting and responding but you're also summing up which is way more sophisticated uh, an analytical uh, action than people give it credit for so, you know, for me, it's learning. You know, annotation is learning. And not only, uh, just to, to Basic, say... go ahead, yeah. To say Introduce yourself bit. after you say your comment. But go ahead, yeah. I'm sorry? Just keep going. Go ahead, yeah. Oh, sure. Um, I just uh, was thinking about what Terry was just saying regarding the reading of poetry. I also love, love poetry, and um, that unpacking of things and, and exposition on, on finer details, that's something that for our annotation tool, and I feel like for Rap Genius and Now Comment, this is definitely also true. It's a lot about that uh, that very contextualized uh, approach to these nuanced things that we're not going to get at. We all know that there's so much, so much content available now. This critical mass that is the whole corpus of the internet, right? And um, with Vialogs, we've chosen to approach video because it seems uh, at at the inception of Vialogs like something. Uh, that was really difficult to have that meaningful, contextualized unpacking of. Um, but just having having a way to do that, to pull things apart with uh, all kinds of multimedia is, you know, it does. It brings the same level of uh, augmented reading, let's call it for a moment, uh, <laughs> that we have had for poetry for a very long time. So I, I think that's a, a great attitude to have about it, and it's it's a big part of our driver and our, our vision for the product here. At the... And Dan, yeah. jump in. Welcome. Yeah. Um, well, thank you. Um, yeah, for me, I, I, I guess I'm, I'm coming at it, I, I certainly agree with everything you guys have said. I'm coming at it from a slightly a, a different uh, point of approach. Um, it really, two, two different paths that kind, kind of came together. Um, in my younger days, I was a little bit more religiously oriented, and um, I'm, I'm used. I was used to the the concept of Bible study, <laughs> or even not even necessarily study, but you know, you're you're reading the Bible, and there are these footnotes, you know, sentence by sentence, that are saying, well, you know, here's the historical background of what this comment was, and this is how this interpreter says, this is how that interpreter said it, and you know, everything was very very contextual, and then. Um, I've been doing computer stuff, you know, 30, 35 years or something, and and the computer world um, was very much, you know, you read an article, and you know, then all the comments are down below, and everything's completely out of context. You're reading something, or you know, uh, the vlogs or something, or or now comment, whether it's audio or uh, video, you're you're listening to something, and then like at the end of the experience then you start finding out what other people are thinking and and that just seemed completely nonsensical to me and that that was the idea for now comment but it was it was based on very you know stuff that's been done you know bible studies and talmud for yeah. thousands of years and i i don't i think that that approach to learning and you know learning from each other and sharing our ideas is is just an inherently human activity and and something that's you know pretty pretty time tested in you know culture after culture, um, so that's where I'm coming at it you know just just a little different from the the nuance and the learning that you were talking about say with the poetry example I'm more of a, 
Jacksonian Democrat in terms of my intentions. And that's like, okay, it started out as a, now comment was a political tool. And we tried to get it ready for the 2008 presidential election. And it was just such a hard problem <laughs> that we, we missed it. We, we, it came out like a month before the election. And it was, it was a little, little hard to get uh, much attention or traction a month before an election. So what, we had, what was the intention we, there, though? What was the well, we, what was we the actually had a, we had an online database of all the political speeches by Obama and McCain in the 2008 election. I, I, I and, do remember uh, this now. And, and and we actually had a lot from some of the third party candidates too, and um, you know we had just a, a a fairly elaborate infrastructure put together, and we're just waiting for this now comment part to to fall into place, and we had everything else like the online databases, and uh, it was really pretty comprehensive, and uh, and then we didn't have the now comment, it just couldn't couldn't bring it together. So after I cried for a couple months for missing the political boat. Um, I was showing up to colleagues at UVA, and they, you know, patted me. A colleague, these are friends who were professors. I'm not connected with UVA, but uh, they patted me on the back and said, "Well, hey, you know, sorry about this politics thing, but this would sure be good for you know college classes, because you know we assign students to read a journal article or a, a piece of literature or or a poem or whatever, and it'd be really nice to have the whole class be able to talk and engage back and forth. So that kind of diverted us onto education." So that's that's kind of the backstory of uh, of now comment. That's uh, I'm really well, just let me say that I'm really loving the historical context that you give to this because you know we forget <laughs> we think that we invented annotation and the Talmud <laughs> was annotated and then the annotations were annotated and then the annotations of the annotations were annotated and that's how much they valued the word so you know yep, it's exactly good right to know, it's good to know there are people like you Dan who are you know really valuing the word like that and you didn't really miss the 2008 election as so much as you uh, provided now you have all these primary sources for uh, <laughs> for historians to look at right well I like I, I like to think of it as getting a really early jump on the 2024 election. <laughs> so, uh, you know, can you talk a little more about fairness, um, th that organization, and then, and I think it relates, Mason, to um, you know, Biologs sits within EdLab too, and I think there is like there there's some connection there too. It's about librarianship or something in a different context. I think in both cases. But could you both describe the parent organizations a little bit more? Sure, Dan, if you wanted to go ahead. Um, sure. I, I, I don't want to just distract too much. Um, Fairness.com is a, you know, it's, it's a, a public, I call it a public interest group. It's not legally a nonprofit. It's, it's, it's my company. But we've been non-commercial for 15 years, so we're really awfully much like a nonprofit. <laughs> and, um, so we're, we don't have any agendas, we don't take positions, we started out doing journalistic stuff and we had, you know, we do still have a big online database of, you know, New York Times articles and, you know, serious journalistic stuff and that's, that's where it was <coughs> assaulting me, you know, I would read these interesting articles and I had abstract or my interns would abstract them on, on fairness.com and we, we don't actually keep that site up much at all these days. It, it may actually wind up disappearing just for time and resources. But um, I'd be reading every day, you know, 10, 20 articles and then finding all these just really great tidbits in the comments that, you know, no one ever saw and, you know, I rarely had the patience to read much. So it, Fairness.com is the organization and now comment is a, a, a software, you know, platform tool project. So um, that's, that's really all I would say about Fairness.com. Sure. And the, the analog is there with EdLab and Biologs, as you mentioned, Paul, um, that uh, Biologs sort of sprang from the, the ongoing mission of, so we at EdLab are, in fact, the, the administrative staff of Gottesman Libraries at Teachers College. Um, mm -hmm. our, our, first, uh, our first aim is to keep up all of the workings of the library for the patrons. Um, we have been lucky enough to evolve to have this... Uh, development and research team um, focused on recontextualizing the library as it uh, kind of changes in 
in the scope of the way that people are learning and, you know, being immersed here in Teachers College and, uh, and the whole dream of the advancement of pedagogy and all of that stuff and people constantly talking about it, you can't help but look to the future a little bit. So, um, so our mission, first of all, is to, is to keep up the library um, and to make sure that it's relevant to the students of today at Teachers College, but also, you know, with the kind of latitude that we have as a, as a pretty well-respected um, institution is we get to push the boundaries a little bit and in that um, we started developing Biologues first as a tool to be uh, a, a house for the video resources of the library um, and later uh, as a, a tool to add value to those resources uh, in a way that's more than just uh, flat transcription, you know, uh, because now for a few years it's been available the technology to do uh, automated closed captioning of video, but part of our idea is that uh, like that deeper reading of, of the Talmud even where not only are those annotations uh, uh, a matter of respect for the text, but they take on uh, a, a deeper meaning as part of the corpus and, you know, there there is no longer the original text in the absence of those meta texts and the meta meta texts and the whole recontextualization of uh, of the original thoughts. In that same way, we think of dialogues as adding value to the video resources for the people who can go in and um, either interface with other community users or just just you know what we call uh, passively experience the text. What what some other sites call lurkers, we call passive users, people who come in and read. You that's, know. A, that's, a, that's a much nicer term. <laughs> <laughs> we try to be democratic. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but um, the, the idea is that for anyone who does get to experience this content, it's going to be more than just the video. And uh, our theory is that that will in some way uh, you know, activate this kind of multi-synaptic process that makes the learning more accessible and makes the video more valuable to us at the library. So is, is there... Is content still being created by the library and your staff, or is it totally, you know, user-driven at this point? Sure, um, we do create content. Um, one of our one of our other projects, NewLearningTimes.com, which is a, a a daily publication for the new learning sector. We like to call it. By the way, I have to do a sidebar on that. We like to not refer too much as uh, not refer too much to EdLab as an edtech institution or anything like that. We're we're very new learning oriented and where there's an ed tech component of that, there's also a, a just a constant examination of what is working in teaching and what is what is changing as far as the change from, uh, you know, over the last 20 years, the, the sort of eschewing of rote memorization in favor of flipped classroom models, things where you're, you're working ahead with students to contextualize a piece of writing, generate some work beforehand, generate some thoughts, re-examine, examine as a group, all of that stuff. But also, you know, um, the, the whole modern maker movement, which I don't think of as an ed tech thing, I think of as a multimodal thing. I think a lot of people would agree with that statement, that it's, it's not necessarily driven by technology, it's driven by uh, the access that people have to the world around them, which is opened up by technology. Um, mm -hmm. I have strayed too far from that question. For the no, but actually, I, 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 I have <laughs> Harry, something, something to share about that. Um, you know, you have news. You have a newsletter that I I wait for every week because I I just absolutely love it, and that takes us into all of your resources that you have there, including one that I've just discovered here recently called Ponder, and Ponder is another one of these annotation tools that uh, is. You know, it has a, it has a kind of a, it's, it's class. I think it's classroom oriented. They're just getting it going, but it too will take in. It kind of is a vacuum cleaner for almost every kind of media imaginable, from text to uh, to videos. Uh, today, I was able to pull in uh, videos from YouTube, Vimeo, and Dropbox. So, you know, they, they are. I I found out about that through. Um, through New Learning Time? Through, uh, yeah, through New Learning Times. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful resource. And it's exactly what I think a library should be, is a, a place for people to come to uh, maybe to make, 
or to find new, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm obsessed with this idea of, of becoming a, a teacher who's also a learning concierge and who brings people together uh, the best way possible for all the things that they need, whatever they are, and then everybody's going to vary. Still revolving around the idea of access to the information. Exactly. Totally. Yeah. That, that's always the bottom line. <laughs> yeah, and to starting point to underscore what Terry says about Ponder, that's one of the one of the products that we've reviewed on New Learning Times. Uh, we've got a whole section on uh, reviews of emergent products and and things that uh, are getting into schools, either you know in New York or worldwide, or are brand new or just really interesting. And Ponder, in particular, is a, is a pretty powerful annotation tool developed by. Uh, by I don't even know where they are. I think they're in New York City because I yeah, think they're, they are, they are. they're deployed yeah. in New York City schools. But um, yeah, a really interesting tool. Definitely worth checking out. I'll I'll give a quick plug for Ed Labs. They um, I, I I I was in New York and got in contact with them also way back in the early days, and they were super nice and hosted me for a an afternoon and a session. And and it seems like just absolutely on top of the the new learning landscape. So you know. Continued good job. <laughs> Thank you very much. So, um, I guess I, you know, we could probably continue in this more philosophical vein for a while, but I do want to look at, at the um, the product a little bit for people who might not be familiar um, with in these two particular products. Um, with with the eye on um, like what they afford, so you know they're. We've mentioned Ponder now. We've mentioned what was that? Rap Genius. We've mentioned, so we're talking about Biologs and now Comment. Um, I've also um, used um, what's it called? <laughs> it's Crocodoc um, as well with, with PDFs, right? So, um, so can, can we do that? Can we look at some of the features? Uh, let's start with now Comment, if you don't mind, um, and and then and then think about some of the. Yeah, how how this might get picked up in various classrooms. I mean, I'm I'm all and I'll add to that one more thing. Sorry, I'm always interested in um, getting students across different in different locations. So you know, at YouthVoices.net, we we have uh, ten or fifteen schools in New York City and and that many outside of New York City as well, working together. Um, oftentimes. Working in parallel, it's like parallel play, <laughs> um, and and um, we're always working to figure out ways that they could be reading articles together and so forth. And that kind of never happens um, on Crocodoc, even though we've been using it for a couple of years now. And there are some wonderful things about Crocodoc. You know, you don't have to log in and all that stuff. So I'll just mention that. Um, but then, you know, it doesn't happen. So no matter how wonderful these tools are. How can we, you know, make them happen in classrooms is, is one of the big questions I want to ask you. So that was a big question. Sorry about that. <laughs> Let's go back. Back. The part of that is looking at some of the features. Um, and we'll start with now comment. I, I think, Dan, you were ready to show some things on the screen. Do you want to try to do that? or Yeah. You know, no, I should. Well, you it, it, worked, it worked the other day when we got ready for it. So let, let's see. <laughs> okay. um, so Google Hangouts. Um, Okay, let's see if this works. Stall for just a second here. Are, are you guys seeing my screen? We're seeing your screen and we're seeing us again. But that's okay, funny. how about this? Is this better? That's perfect. Okay, so yep. I'll I'll, I'll well, talk it was about for a second. Yeah, good. Oh, yep. did, did, did it wig out? No, it's good. Yep, go okay. ahead. Okay, so let me let me talk about a. Here's a. Is this a nice, pretty picture? Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. Good yep. enough. So you're seeing it. So now comment. Uh, this is a so document. Dan, just want to say, don't don't assume you're talking to us. Assume you're talking to somebody who doesn't know now comment. But go ahead. Yeah. All right. Okay. Yeah. This this is going out to uh, Johnny in uh, Baton Rouge. Okay. Yeah. And um, so what I have here, uh, I'm on the now comment site. Uh, documents get loaded onto our server. It's our our, our product is free. Um, all we do, you, you give us your name, an email address, and uh, promise not to crash our server, and you have a free account. Uh, and we also actually, next week, we will have uh, accounts for people that don't have email. That's specifically with elementary school students in mind. 
But anyway, so here we have a document that's on our server. Um, the original document is on the left-hand side, and uh, you'll notice that there are these little flags here where there are comments, and they're, they're not very obtrusive flags. So the idea is that you can be scrolling down a document, and if I'm interested in this first paragraph, you can, I don't know if you can see this on the screen, there's highlighting of the individual sentences, mm -hmm. but um, if I'm reading this paragraph, I can see, oh, there's a comment on this particular sentence. It's embedded in there. Um, once you've used now comment for more than about five or six minutes, you don't even notice the flags unless you know you're interested in seeing what the comments are. So you can be reading down, and obviously we take picture, uh, we handle images and photos. We also handle videos. Um, so this is a, a classic uh, fracking, anti-fracking video. That's a lot of fun, but I won't try and play that now. Go ahead, just so, so we can see what it, what ah, happens okay. first. Just a second. Just. Sure. Let me. So the video plays. Unlike Biologs, you can't do within, but you could comment on the whole video. Yeah. yeah. Got it. OK. <laughs> but it does keep it in the context of the article, which is interesting. Yeah. Well, it does. And so mm -hmm. let, let's say you're interested in this video. So you see there's this, this three, this little word balloon here. So watch the right-hand part of the screen. The right-hand side is where the comments live. And when I click on this three, it's going to scroll the right-hand side to see the corresponding comments. So here are the thing. It highlight them in yellow, and it kind of fades away. But these are the three comments on this video. Mm -hmm. So I'm here, this Dan Dornberg guy. He made a general comment about the video. And then, and so that's a thread, and if someone wants to talk about the video in general, I'm going to stop this so it's not distracting. Mm -hmm. um, then I've made a separate comment that's in a separate thread that's talking about the part of the video from 13 seconds to 30 seconds, and I had something to say about that segment. Now, I think for video, um, Vialog is going to be more sophisticated, and uh, I was actually in communication with, uh, I don't know if the admin was Mason or not, but... Uh, I'm actually interested in maybe we can embed and, and make our video a little bit, uh, um, whoops, I lost the thing. Um, but anyway, the, it, it, it works to comment on video, and pictures are the same way. Here's the, mm -hmm. if I want to see what the four comments are about this picture, it scrolls, you know, the system's pretty peppy, and it scrolls right away, and here are the four comments on the picture. Mm -hmm. So the idea is you can have an infinite number of comments on any sentence, you can have infinite number of comments on any video, on any uh, image, and let me look just for a second at... And just, and just let me say, I mean, I, I referred to Crocodile earlier, so what what immediately was evident to me when I looked at comment was, wow, that's organized. You know, it's like when you get when you get 20 kids on, on uh, you know, a Crocodile or even five, you can't find where the comments are. You can't see where, you know, it's a little hard to follow. So it's a really nice um, interface for following comments. Well, thank you. That, that's, that's why, unfortunately, the, the flip side of that is that's why we missed the election. <laughs> right. <laughs> because, because the interface is really hard, and we've actually been working and refining it for about almost six years now. So it is, and, and we've handled it at, at Hunter College. Uh, one of the professors in Hunter College in New York, she routinely has a class of 30 students with, you know, maybe making four or five hundred comments on a document. And it's very organized. It, you know, the server handles it fine. And you have real conversations. It's, it's really nice the way she, uh, she has it working with her class. But we, we do have the same thing with middle school kids. Uh, and we have some second graders in Cincinnati who have used it as well. So Dan, talk a little more about the features here. Up on top right, uh, updates. You can turn that on, and the updates come to your email. Um, yeah, I, updates. I noticed, by the way, they they collect nicely. You don't get like every time somebody responds. But yep, that's yeah. a relatively new feature. That <clears throat> I, I always worry that people who saw now comment like a year or two or three ago have a really you know <laughs> out of date perception because we did <laughs> used to send a, uh, an email immediately 
whenever, you know, if you wanted to get notified of something, you got a notification right away. And then about a year ago, we added a, what we call the Daily Digest. And uh, you'll get an email, if you want, once a day, and it'll say, you know, here's all the new documents you've been invited to. Well, actually, you always get invited a notific email about new documents that you've been invited to. But all the other stuff, it categorizes it, you know, here's this you might want to know, here's that you might want to know, but just in one email a day. Now, I like to get emails right away, so, you know, I'll get two or three hundred emails from now comment a day, but they're such nice people, I, I just, I just <laughs> like hearing from them. But um, so in terms of features, um, let me talk just a little bit about comments for a second. I'm going to highlight. Uh, well, this didn't hold it down right. If you look at the, whoops, did too much. Sorry. Anyway, I'm looking at this top one that looks like South Montrose is a beautiful part of rural Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. This is actually a really important um, feature for us of now comment, and we we're idiosyncratic here. But I decided early on that. Comment should not be a comment should not be one field. For there are two reasons I think why a comment should have like a summary, like what's your main point? What do you want people to know? And that's 255 characters max, and that's required of every comment. And then you can <clears throat> beyond that, if you want, you can write five, six, ten, twenty, thirty pages, you know your manifesto, uh, whatever, but every time, because this is group oriented, again it was designed with the election in mind, and we, we built a system that hopefully will scale to a hundred, a thousand users, you know, with ten thousand comments, and, and we think our design will handle that pretty nicely, or hopefully very nicely. So anyway, so every comment has at least a summary, what's my main point, and one of the things you can do is you I, right now you see this this box here says full above mm -hmm. where it says paragraph two mm -hmm. so we're seeing the full comments but if I click the summaries watch again the right hand pane and it's going to collapse everything so if you want to I can just even if there are a thousand comments I can skim really fast and get an idea what you know most people are talking about this and oh somebody brought up that aspect that's interesting and then I can explore at my leisure, you know, as many of the comments as I want, but I can read really quickly and see what's going on. So another thing you can do, and this is, oh, I, actually, I should finish up here. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to restore the full comments, um, or I, I could have just restored one of them in less detail or more. But anyway, um, for classroom teachers, and I'm thinking English teachers, writers, um, critical thinking, um, this requirement that every comment have like you know concisely what is your main point what do you what are you trying to tell the other people in the group that's a really really good critical thinking tool close reading tool communication you know it really forces the students before they just start writing and who knows where it's going whether they start with the summary or and then go from there or they write whatever they want and then try and summarize it, it's a really good critical thinking tool and we've had a lot of really enthusiastic response from teachers who are, you know, doing Common Core, and uh, you know, even the states that aren't doing Common Core. That that critical thinking component well, is really important. And I referred earlier to Ann Vertoff, um, and mm -hmm. you're I, you're not essentially an educator, but I'll point you to her. <laughs> her okay. Certainly, I mean, her work around dialectical note taking, I think, is really important, and others. But ah, um, okay. so it really fits that well as well. Um, so in my own pedagogy, um, the annotation is like your first read through, maybe, and then what what you're doing on now comment is more like dialectical note taking, where you're going kind of more carefully. I, I have students in that first box um, try to say what the author is saying or say what's there in the image, mm -hmm. and then put their thoughts in the box below. But, you know, just... Yeah, no, no, it's, it's, a, it's a totally flexible tool. So you can, you can use it as an in-depth kind of a tool. You can also use it as, what, what, especially in the younger grades, it's more, again, my Jacksonian democracy, like, hey, guys, you know, here's this fun article. What do you think? And, you know, a kid from this background talks about what, how his family you know what this means to them and someone else like oh wow that's really weird and and you know and it's really engaging to the students um, and again this this is basically a it's a very conversational 
form of online social media. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, there's no red ink, no one's correcting anything. Um, just people are free to throw in their comments and, you know, respond to each other. And, you know, it, it's, it's kind of funny. There's some kind of a, a parabola or inverted parabola. The younger kids really, really like it. And the graduate students really, really like it. And the people in the middle, depending on you know, the social dynamics of that particular class and those particular kids. Um, you know, high school and middle school kids like it a lot and we're getting tons and tons of usage from high schools and middle schools. Mm -hmm. But <laughs> we, we, we added all these features for elementary school kids because they seem to be like really grabbed by it. <laughs> mm, cool. Um, so, show, show the sorted. You sure. Know so yeah. as a teacher, you know, perhaps you work at a school that has some kind of grading involved. And so you can at any point... You yeah, can, a few of us do, yeah. Yeah, a couple <laughs> do. Okay, yeah. I, my schools used to do that, too. It was really annoying. But um, <laughs> anyway, you click the sorted button, and the default is to sort it by, by the person's name. You can either sort by last name or sort by first name, or, or some other ways. What's the oldest one? What's the newest one? But the most common is probably the last name. And it does the work for you. It says this Dan Dornberg guy, he made 14 comments. Uh -huh. But you're not just getting quantitative, he made 14. You can look and see what he had to say, and you can decide if this is, you know, a check or a check plus sure. or an A or an F or whatever. And so it does can I, can I link to that sorted page also? Uh, link to, well, it's, it, it's the same page, really. It's more like a JavaScript thing. Okay. It, it doesn't really have a different, if you, if you link to that just page, yeah. this is just built into every single now comment page, Got it. a document page. And um, I should also mention you can run this. You can run a similar report across multiple documents. So if you've been using now comment over the course of a term, or say for a particular project, and there's five documents or twenty documents or a thousand documents, you can run a report that'll do this for like the whole term. And you say, you know, Johnny made a thousand comments, but you know, Mary only made five hundred and sixty-three. So Dan. Uh huh. I, let's go with more, I mean, like basics, um, That what else, and then let's look at Vialogs a little bit, and then we'll come sure. back. Sure, sure. Uh, what, what else, so what else would you want to absolutely mention before we move to Vialogs? And just in terms of some of the interesting features? Yeah. Um, yeah. I'll, I'll just kind of tick through some stuff, I guess. Um, well, you can you can make assignments. You can ask a class, uh -huh. I want at least Which I've three. never done. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, you, see, you can say, and, and these are all, you can, you can do none of these, or you can do all of them or anywhere in between, but you can set a minimum, you know, I want everyone in the class to make at least three comments. Um, and then, you know, you, you'll find out when you do that sort whether they made it or not. You can also set a maximum, and our, our software will enforce that. If you tell the group no more than ten comments, you know, they will not, the, no individual will make an eleventh comment. Uh, and you can also say when the assignment is due, and you can set an email reminder. You know, if it's due Friday at noon, you might want to send out Wednesday afternoon telling them they've got two more days. Mm -hmm. So anyway, that, that's big. Um, now, comment is very egalitarian and non-hierarchical in that we don't have rigidly teachers and students. We have the people who owns the document. The people. I think that's bad grammar. Forget I said that. I got it. Yeah. There's the person who owns the document. They have control of it, and then they invite other people to the document. There's this invite link here. Mm -hmm. I just clicked on. So anyway, what it means is there's no teacher that's act has to act as the central administrator or gatekeeper. The students can upload their own documents, and the students can also make their own groups. So let's say you have a class of 30 people. Either the teacher or the students or both can create their own work groups and teams and that kind of thing. And it's very on the fly. So it, it's just dead simple. Like I say, second graders are doing this stuff. Um, we have a built-in blogging feature, which I, I think I don't have the time to try and show it or explain it. But what it's basically doing is all the now comment documents that either you personally or say a class has done, you can compile them together in a now comment blog. And it basically has links. You know, the blog is just kind of like summaries and abstracts. And then so you can let people know what the new documents are. They can subscribe to the blog. 
and then if someone wants to read a document on the blog, then they're getting this kind of full-blown interactive now comment treatment. Mm -hmm. um, and that blog uh, goes out publicly, obviously. So well, it, it can be public. The, the rest it, of this is you have to log in to get to it. Yeah, well, it, you can do it either way. You can make it public or private. Okay, good. Okay. Uh, and we do have documents by default are private. So if you're using now comment, unless you take a sort of an override kind of a step, your document is just, you know, when you upload a document, it's just you. And then if you want to share it with Joe, you have to invite Joe. And mm -hmm. if you want to invite it, invite your whole class, then you, would, you could create a group called uh, English 101 invite 20 people to that group and then for the rest of the term when you want to share a document you just say hey English 101 you know I'm inviting you to the document so um, I'm, I, I'm sorry to be rushing you I am a little bit though um, no no no, no, no just you know I, there's a reference earlier and I want to explore the reference to how any of this relates to the maker movement um, and it's in that video that um, Terry you put up um, recently, I don't know if you put it up recently, but I watched it recently. Hey, too, but um, but you're certainly a maker. This is <laughs> something you've been making for many years now. Um, yeah, this this is kind of my baby. Yeah, right. I, so, I'll say, if I can, I'll, I'll say there's one other okay. feature that I think is 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 really well. Yeah, I want. I'll just stick to one other. <laughs> um, one of the things that you can do is um, you have control over the time and date of when people can access the document. So for example, if you want to use this as a, for testing purposes, which, which is actually not a common usage, but what you can do is you can upload the document and not let, this is the document owner, which most often is the teacher, but not necessarily. And uh, the person who uploads the document can keep other people from seeing the other comments that are being made until a certain date. So if you want to, say, assign a document to a class, have every, all the students make their comments, and all their comments have to be in by Friday noon, and then at 12.01 in the afternoon, you can kind of raise the curtain and then let the students see what all their peers had to say, and then if you want, do a second round of, like, interacting with each other. It's like, okay, now that you can see what your friends had to say, you know, what do you think? Yeah, so beyond, anyway, beyond testing, it just might organize the conversation. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So many, many different ways to skin the cat. Um, a lot of teachers will have the students. Well, I mean, having making students do online commenting. First of all, is just a really good way of seeing whether they've done the reading or not. Um, so a lot of teachers just love it just for that reason alone. It, it's pretty hard for the students to fake with you know by making an intelligent comment or not. Yeah, and, and if I could put a positive spin on that, sure. <laughs> meaning um, the word accountability is um, you know abused too much. I it, it's it's about accountability, but what one way to think about accountability is that it gives credit to you for doing your work, right? So, Absolutely. You know, so so you know, in, in a sense, it says, all right, if you really read this carefully and thoughtfully, we'll be able to see that, and you know, it, we won't miss it. Well, so, you know, there, there's an interesting, there's an, if I can just throw in, there's a, there's a really quick corollary to that. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you think about sort of information theory and, you know, reading versus talking, when, when you're discussing this uh, an assignment or a poem, whatever, face to face, you know, one person talks, everyone else in the group listens, and, you know, the number of comments that can be made is, is somewhat limited. When you're doing this asynchronous, written commenting, if you have a student who's really diligent and just really into it, and they want to make 20, 25 comments because they're really, really into it, they can go ahead and do that, and it's different from a verbal face-to-face -face thing where if I'm making 25 comments in an hour class, well, I'm dominating the conversation and no one else gets their turns. So anyway, it is, it's accountability and it's, it's letting the kids engage and you know, have the freedom to talk about what they want to talk about and respond to what they want to respond to. Mm -hmm. So anyway, let me let me let me leave it at that maybe and make sure we have enough time for uh, for dialogues. Yeah, dialogues. And, and and just to say, you're still developing, right? I mean, you're still working on this. Absolutely, thing. we're. I think next week we're going to have um, logging in with your Google. Like we already have Facebook login. Mm -hmm. And uh, oh, and I should definitely mention we we also have LTI. Early, uh, so if you you know you don't have to have people making separate accounts, you can use your school's Blackboard or LMS or whatever 
shibboleth. Some people at UVA used shibboleth way back when. But anyway, yeah, we, we're, we're constantly adding new stuff and, you know, we, in terms of features, we, we think it, it is pretty fully featured. I, I've, I've only talked about probably half of the important features, <laughs> but I'll, I'll leave it at that for now. Thank you. Thank you for that and for giving turn here too. Um, so, Mason, sure. you're, you're, you haven't been there uh, for seven years, but no. you're now the project manager of Vialogs. That's right. Um, I've been here since, uh, since spring of this year. So talk to us about Vialogs. What's, um, maybe show us some features or talk about some features at least. Yeah. Forgive me, I'm new to Hangouts. I'll go ahead and try to uh, so try? Okay, try the screen share thing. But, uh, let me know if this works. Looks like it's working. You got it? Well, not yet. Yep, there you go. Oh. Right there. Yep, go so ahead. Vialogs, um, it's really interesting to, to check out now comment and uh, it's a really good example of um, a lot of functionality for not only for uh, for putting together the content with the annotation, but also for uh, facilitating the moderation of that stuff. And you know, there's this growing body of research. The the researchers at EdLab and and the researchers at, at other institutions are constantly pointing to if you want to have good online discussion, moderate, moderate, moderate. So whatever you're doing to empower moderators is going to be just an automatic improvement to discussion. So kudos especially on that last feature for contextualization. That's great. Oh, thank you. Um, our what, do you what do you mean by moderate, though? I, say, I, I really mean uh, scaffolding conversation, but also uh, making sure that that conversation doesn't fall apart when it gets started. So, you you know, getting started with uh, um, formative assessments or, or suggestions on and what you might want a student to take away from the video for to take a vocabulary from the traditional classroom. Um, this is just critical stuff if you want to get the conversation started meaningfully. And then once it gets started, it's it's a lot about uh, you know continuing to challenge um, expectation or statement. Just just the the replying back and forth does a lot to keep the conversation going. Um, we took a, a little bit of a different tack when we got started. Um, I should say about Vialogs that it's a, uh, a research-based and, and uh, designed with uh, intent to continue research of, of the corpus of comments kind of tool. Um, we are therefore not really, uh, at, at least at this point, we don't have functionality to explicitly mark the tops of a, a set of comments. So. For instance, here on the screen, we've got this this threaded discussion where Sappho makes a comment at 46 seconds in the video, and and we all kind of continue down that rabbit hole. Um, instead of putting a title on top of that, what we do is we allow the user to say, where are we having some increased comment density? Where where in this video are people really interested, and where do they pick up on what each other are saying. So yeah, I've never seen that. That's cool. I'm yeah, sorry. you've got this this tab below the video where you can just at a glance see what's interesting in the video. And if I click on that, and then if I was to hit, to hit play, click where I'm going, it'll take me right to that moment in the video. And then once it takes me to that moment in the video, it'll and these times are off a little bit due to the way that we uh, we cut up that that timeline, but. Uh, Basically, it'll take me to the, the point in the video where this big conversation is happening, and then it's up to me to go ahead and review and see if what I'm learning over here on the right is reconciling with the video and you know making an informed comment that way, um, reacting to my, my classmates or what have you. Um, you see that ours is threaded discussion, if at any point I want to see. So business model is not relevant for education. What business model is he referring to? Ask Sappho. Um, and that's a, that's an interesting question. So I want to know what Sappho is talking about. So again, I'll down the I'll road. That, that may uh, be something we need to start thinking about. That embedded link in the comment, and mm -hmm. it'll take me right to that point in the video. If I was to leave this playing, this would be, you know, actively jumping around the video and pausing just so that uh, I'm not talking over this fella. Um, another another kind of feature that we have uh, for moderators, and by the way, the way that we structure this is. Uh, at the outset, when you create a dialogue, it's either explicitly public or uh, explicitly selective, where you must choose the users, or else uh, 
you can distribute to them uh, a private key that allows them to get into it. Any logged out user can come in and look at a public dialog. You have to be logged in in order to comment. Um, and that's, that was originally as a, as a part of our strategy to, uh, to um, sort of try to understand the way that people are navigating the content and what are valuable features to users as far as uh, commenting and replying um, and just your, your typical user analytics kind of stuff. Um, so uh, another thing, as I was saying, that we, we have available to us in videos is, uh, let me find a video real quick that I'm a moderator of. And, uh, so you're a moderator if you put the video up? Is that right? right. So I, if, I, if I create the dialogue, I'm a moderator. I'm not the mm -hmm. owner. I'm just one of the people who have access to the, uh, to the access rights of other users. Um, and I can assign that same privilege to other people with, you can. Right. Yeah. and I can, you know, I can add other users to a selective dialogue. Um, I think I know this, but um, let me just check. You can, and you can put up your own um, right. yeah, so video. What are the other things you can put up? You, right. YouTube or Vimeo, is that right? You can do YouTube or Vimeo for linked content, and if, uh, if you have uh, your own content that you want to upload, there's a, a whole range of file types that we support. Um, Which, and, by the way, TED Talks, you can all you can download those and upload those easily, right? Sure, and a, and a lot of those are available directly on Vimeo and YouTube. So it's, I, I don't want to get off on this, but quickly, because I, I want to get back to the moderation thing you were talking about. How do you guys deal with, like, is there any copyright issue that you guys deal with or not? Um, it's never been brought to our attention by anyone. Um, that's a that's an interesting question to me personally because I, I'm interested in the way that the the DMCA works. But that's that's basically the the governance of that. Um, no one from YouTube or or Vimeo has ever contacted us if that's what you're asking. And certainly they wouldn't make these videos available uh, from their APIs if if they had some problem. Yeah, I can't. Yeah. And Dan, what about you? Do, is that an issue with you? Um, pretty much. Pretty much the same answer. I mean, I'm, I'm coming from a, a publishing background, mm -hmm. so that that was, you know, it's, it's certainly a concern I'm always, you know, cognizant of. Um, one is, you know, as a, a provider on this kind of site, we have the, you know, the DMCA safe harbor protections, which, which actually are, are under threat right now, <laughs> but um, there, there's a new thing in the last week, maybe the last couple of days. But anyway, um, and the other thing is, you know, we never know what kind of licensing you know, one of our the universities using our software or a school. You know, we would we just have no way of knowing what things they do or don't have access to from their own licenses, and you know, who's to define what yeah. fair use is. So we just have our users take responsibility for what they post. Got it. Yeah. All right. Sorry, I don't want to spend a lot. Of sure. But yeah, it's interesting. It is so, an interesting question. Yeah. So Mason. Sure. You were talking about one that you moderate, and you were going to show us something. Right. So the, the one of our other uh, features that we think is pretty helpful to educators, I'm going to go ahead and mute this so that I can pull myself someplace in the video. Um, so as you see, we've got these timestamp comments, so I'll just do test comment. Um, mm -hmm. But we've also got functionality to, to embed surveys, and those can either be multiple choice or check all that apply and, you know, uh, does an understanding of music help you understand science? And any user could could put that in? As of right now, it's only moderators who can only moderators can do it. But any user who has access to the dialogue is going to be able to, to go ahead yeah. and answer. Okay. Um, but only moderators can create. Got it. Right. And then mm -hmm. here it sits and um, if I submit my answer, or if uh, some other set of users submits their answers, I can go into the settings and I can see uh, a sort of rundown of the statistics for who's answered this. This is just aggregate uh, over the whole set of users who are invited to the dialog to participate. Um, so that's that's something that we're we're thinking a lot about now. If, if there's a way that we can uh, we can improve that functionality for users. Um, how, how, do you have a sense of how it's being been used and how people like it or so? Yeah. 
based on our understanding of the tool and the way that users have been using it, the surveys are uh, are not as highly utilized as we would expect. Um, basically, people are just as likely to want to start uh, a, a, just a threaded conversation with uh, a suggestion or a question, and it's not always, especially in um, in the higher education, it's not always the most advantageous thing to put in a, a, a survey of multiple choice. You know, so. It, it's a lot to do with the intent of the users and what kind of conversations they want to have. Um, to say a little more about the way that this was originally designed and uh, and the dialogues that we that we have on here and that we've we've looked at, um, we were trying to be really, like I said, agnostic about uh, about giving users a lot of tools about explicit contextualization. And that's with a view toward uh, toward doing some some algorithmic uh, guidance, some stuff that's more based on, uh, on on what users are talking about with respect to the video and what their shared context is with their community of fellow users. Um, that's ongoing research that we are doing, uh, not only on our product but uh, in a few different places where we've got text corpuses associated with uh, with video. Um, so, mm -hmm. there's, I mean, as far as other functionality, there's... Uh, and what's the, can you say quickly, what's the goal of that research? The goal of that research is mm -hmm. to, first of all, determine if our assumptions about, uh, about hosting a video, or hosting a discussion around video, uh, to see if there is some, some, uh, some value to that assumption that it's improving the discussion. And then to see if it does improve that discussion, what are the best ways that that happens? What are the, the most effective techniques for improving pedagogy that way? Um, and just a, a lot like the aims of, of the other folks who make these annotation tools, it's to do with improving, uh, improving capability in, in classrooms and for, for independent learners too, so-called autodidacts, these people who have always had an easy time picking up a video and gleaning what they will from it. Mm. Yeah, I, I can just jump in for a quick second. It, it's been interesting yeah. to me. And Dan, can you can you um, toggle back out of your screen share? So oh, oh, I, oh I'm still in it. Oh, I'm okay. sorry. That's ah, okay. Didn't didn't mean to do that. Yeah. Um, That's why I thought that. I was wondering why my picture wasn't showing. Okay, is that better? There you go. Okay. okay. Well, it was just right. interesting what uh, what Mason was just talking about. I I'm I'm not an education person, um, you know, by training or anything, and I don't follow the literature, you know. I don't have enough hours in the day, but I, I, I've been surprised that there, you know, there aren't more, you know, aspiring PhDs out there who are doing some just, you know, kind of the real simple, like, you know, we had one section of the class that did face-to-face -face discussion and another section use now comment and, you know, let's see what, and another one use Vylogs and let's, let's see how they turned out. And I, I just haven't seen much of that kind of research. For, for what it's worth, so if you're some of the teachers out <laughs> in your audience are working on their PhD, looking for thesis topics, uh, please please call. <laughs> yeah. well, I think research is being done. It's just kind of um, uh, low uh, barrier, low risk action research where uh -huh. a student will actually do that in the classroom, but doesn't write it up because it's <laughs> hours in the day, you know. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So I, th I think there's a lot of kind of that A B. Uh, research that's being done in the classroom. You mean people yeah. are, are messing around and trying to figure it out themselves? Yeah, I think so. I think, I, so. I think that there, there's another thing which is uh, really quickly analogous to the, the divide between uh, tech people in ed tech and educators. You know, it's funny that Dan points out that he's not from an education background, but, you know, here we are on an ed tech show, and this is something that seems to be a theme with a lot of people in this industry is that... Uh, there's this gulf between educators and, and technologists where only in the last couple of years are we are we really facing that that's something that needs to be reconciled and it's it's related also to that question that you asked at the beginning how are we really going to get these tools into work in schools and how are we going to make this effective um, I think by reading the New Learning Times <laughs> I hope you tell your friends but, uh, what I wanted to say about that is um, there, there is also this research that does go on uh, among the professors at, at schools like Teachers College. In fact, we, we have a professor here, Deanna Kuhn, who does, um, 
who does some research about uh, the effect of, of uh, debate methodology, pedagogy among students, and how that how that changes their ability to you know otherwise perform in class. And this stuff, um, you know, it doesn't sound like it's really related to online discussion, but she came in and, and gave a talk at EdLab uh, a few weeks ago. And as I'm watching this, you know, I'm thinking that this translation is part of our job as education technologists is to recognize where this research is happening that's going to be applicable even when it's not explicitly about our products or even when it's not, you know, A-B testing of, of what we're doing. It's incumbent on us and we take it unwillingly that uh, we're going to, uh, to turn that research which is just about pedagogy or just about discussion and make it about pedagogy and discussion. Mm -hmm. Can I, can I jump in and follow something that Mason had said? One of the things you focused on when you were chatting with him was about that, that role and the importance of moderation. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to just mention really quickly from a now comment context that um, the, um, the, the person who owns, who uploaded the document is sort of the, is the, the moderator. And they can, they can uh, delete things. And they can also edit, like you know, again, with the teacher mm -hmm. we're thinking of classroom in mind. So if a student says something inappropriate, I didn't realize that. That's yeah, cool. Yeah, yeah. but if, if if someone makes an edit, there is an audit trail. So it's not you can't just modify someone's thing and you know no one knows that it was changed. Mm -hmm. But um, but yeah, so we have those kind of protections, and it is, you know, for those who've been around online communities and trolls and such, it is really important to have those features there. And you, we also have the ability to make private replies. So if, a te if someone says something that's maybe starting to get a little bit inappropriate, the teacher or another classmate could send them a private reply, you know, hey, John, maybe you want to tone it down a little bit. And no one will see it but John. So I don't want to oversimplify or anything, but um, <laughs> when I, I just worked with um, 17 high school students from all over the city. And when we brought up annotation, and just said, you know, describe annotation to us. We got amazingly thoughtful answers from them, right? But it was all annotation on paper that they were doing. Um, so it's in the culture, I think, at least through that, that experience, which you suggest that to me. Um, and the value of, you know, online connection and talking to each other is in the culture, too. Bringing those two together, I think, is is still to happen. Um, and uh, I mean, it is happening somewhat. I'd love to see it happen more. Um, and that's what I think your tools are doing. Again, I think that's a, a bit of an oversimplification, but I think if we can get teachers to say, you know, the power of, you know, threaded discussions and the power of annotation, there's a way to bring those two things together. Um, we've got something there. As you say, with, uh, with the approach to to almost social network status. It's as if we're coming at it from the opposite side, where, uh, you know, emphasizing too quickly just connectivity, simple connectivity, despite or, you know, next to the whole realm of content that we've got on the internet and in the whole rest of our lives to be documented. Um, maybe there was some way that we missed that with Facebook and with Twitter, but with these tools. It, it seems to me, um, with dialogues, some people think of it as a social network, and we really don't. And we realize that uh, that some of that functionality is emergent as we continue to allow users new ways of interacting with each other. Similarly, it looks like you've got that kind of uh, emergent networking that happens with uh, with now comment and other other tools like this, where you've got these groups, uh, what we used to call. Uh, uh, communities of practice, but which in, in practice are more more like traditional classrooms when you deploy this product. Um, mm -hmm. They become a kind of social network, and, and you get to wondering what are the meaningful ways that we're going to be able to interact that boost our knowledge of the world. Yeah. That's well, as, as, our, as our user community grows, Paul was mentioning that idea of having um, a teacher in you know, one classroom sharing a, a, that you do the same reading with another class, and um, I've I, I, I had a, a high school English class in England and um, England, Florida, and I can't remember the other state. We're all reading the same book, and uh, at roughly the same time, you know, I can see from their logs what what they're doing. And I said, hey, you know, I just sent an email, and would you guys be interested in 
you know, would the American students be interested in having a British, you know, chatting with the English students about, you know, this, this book? And uh, it didn't happen that time. It was kind of late in the year and kind of impromptu. But, but as with, with now comment, if you have an account, you can invite the whole world to it. You're not limited to just a classroom or, you know, if you're a teacher and you want to invite a colleague from Harvard and your brother-in-law and, you know, whoever, it, you're welcome to do that. Or so the I think, author, yeah. Or yeah, yeah, exactly. Book book club. Here we go. But um, yeah, I think I think a lot of those uses are definitely going to be emergent, and it, it's you know some of them you just see it coming, and others you know will just you know be totally blindsided. Cool. Well, I so I go carry last thoughts, but go ahead, please. I'm going to throw a cautionary note into all of this. Oh, um, <laughs> that's, the best that's, what I, that's just what I do. Um, <laughs> that's okay. And. I mean, I, you know, I'm a user. Uh, I love the whole user experience thing. I spent about an hour and a half this afternoon uh, going back and forth with uh, with uh, one of the guys, Alex at Ponder, helping me, helping me with some of this stuff. And um, I read, I, I can't cite this statistic, but I'm going to say it anyway because I will. I am looking for it. You know, the sheer volume of of noise that we are generating. And I can't think of it as any other way as noise and until we until it becomes a signal. And only becomes a signal when it reaches somebody else. But the sheer volume of it was ninety percent of all the data that's ever that's been produced has been produced since two thousand nine. And we've analyzed probably less than ten percent of that information. So, you know, we have to be really careful here as to what we're doing. When we say, okay, let's, you know, and we are, you know, as these roll out and as the Common Core rolls out, we're going to get a tremendous influx of information into various servers in various places. And they're all going to be doing close reading and they're all going to be using, they're all be doing this. And, you know, the next, the real step we need to be doing is, is showing kids how, how this is a filter for the information that they're getting in their lives. It's a it's a much it's a much more important question than just okay do the close reading you know okay let's do the step beyond the close reading which is let's make some sense out of it uh, we can gather the information like crazy we can gather the comments like crazy but what do we do with the comments it's my biggest the biggest problem I have with most of the stuff that's called curation is that it's not curation you know there's not a winnowing down and a filtering of the information into effective things that you can use in your life. So, yeah, I love I love the noise, and sometimes you got to go through this, the noise to get to the signal. But at some point, it's just it yeah. just becomes so incredible. Can and, can, and I, our, can, our, can I mention something there? Yeah, sure. Uh, on that point, one, one of the interesting things I think about about all these tools, not I mean certainly now comment, but I, I think all of them that you've mentioned, is that it can you know pedagogically. It, it can they can be used very very flexibly so for example if a teacher assigns a reading or a video or whatever you can have students do sort of a pre-filtering a, a group of people do some pre-filtering online and you get a lot of ideas thrown out but then the other students can also say oh you know Joe you you know you didn't think about this aspect of it I, I don't I don't think that idea holds up and so you can do sort of some pre-filtering online and when you pair it with, you still maybe do the face-to-face -face discussion, and that's the most common use of now comment, is they do some online stuff to, you know, ensure accountability and to just get these ideas out there so the students can kind of let it percolate. And then when they come in and they still do the face-to-face -face discussion, you, you know, what the teachers report is, is they are getting a more refined, less noisy. Um, you know, a good product is coming out of the face-to-face -face discussions. So in some ways, doing this pre-filtering online kind of has the goal of having a higher quality, you know, final result um, with face-to-face. -face. And of course, you could flip it around the other way and you could do face-to-face -face just to hear everyone's kind of off-the-cuff crazy ideas, <laughs> or creative ideas, I should say, to be positive. And then kids could go home and really think about it and you know, come up with some very thoughtful online comments, and you can structure the stuff and have it, you know, have them work together in whatever ways the teacher's creativity 
um, leads them to, to use them hmm. for what it's worth. No, that's very... Um, the longer we go, the more thoughtful you guys are getting. But um, that's great. Thank you for the details and for the philosophy here, <laughs> guys. Tonight has been great. Um, I do want to cut us off, though, um, time-wise here. Um, there's more that could be said, obviously. But um, we are going to finish for tonight. Um, I, You know... Um, I would love to get uh, return to this with some actual, like people who are using it in their classroom kind of um, conversation too. Um, so we'll look to do that in the fall. Um, we are here every Wednesday night. We are um, uh, Teachers Teaching Teachers, which is a uh, channel of the World Bridges Network. Um, Ed Tech Talk, I should say, is. And uh, Dave Cormier and Jeff Lebo started that whole network. Thank you uh, for coming tonight. Next week we may change the time a little bit. We may be up around 2 o'clock Eastern time because we're going to meet with Don Reed and into August we're starting to think about um, putting together units of study that uh, different uh, people within Youth Voices might be doing. So that's some of the work we'll be going forward with. Um, using some of these tools obviously, but um, Come back anytime, guys. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for the invitation. Really enjoyed it. Okay. Oh, thanks, Jason. Okay. I'll be bye bye. Bye bye. Bye.